Good evening, everyone. I'm coming to you at 6.59 Central Time in the state of Texas. And I am moving forward with the study on how to interpret, interpret reading the Bible. Forgive me my speech. Um, again, it's been a week. The, the job was okay this week. It's just, you know, getting up and <laughs> moving around, but... It was very interesting today. Um, I love speaking to people. I love speaking to God's people. And just, and through conversation, you know, talking about Him and saying how good He is. But let's start off this Bible teaching. Um, chapter 1. In reference to the introduction for the need to interpret. And then the introduction for the need to interpret will be broken down into parts and sections. And I'd like to start off with a prayer. Lord, I come before you and all of those that are assigned to me to hear your words through this teaching. And you have allowed me to use this book, these authors to guide your people to learn to have a understanding of how to read your word and how to seek and search you out through scriptures. I ask that again that this session is successful and that the Holy Spirit keep our minds and our hearts and everything focused to hear what you would speak through me. I ask this in Jesus, Yeshua's name, Amen. Good evening, everyone. As I begin this study, again, I will show you the book that I am um, teaching from, and it's How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. And that's, again, this study is to, it's a Bible study, but it's a Bible study to help individuals learn how to read the Word of God. And I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. I'm just going to get on the wheel and take this chapter and read it to those who are, really, who are willing to listen. This the um, book, and again, comes from the authors of Garden D. Fee and Douglas Stewart. And again, I encourage people who want to uh, listen to this teaching as well as who wants to truly get an understanding of how to read the God. I mean, read the Word of God and truly seek the Word of God for yourself. Okay, so I will begin by saying, and this is all in quotation, Ever so often we meet someone who says with great feeling, You don't have to interpret the Bible. Just read it and do what it says. Usually such a remark reflects the layperson's protest against the professional scholar, pastor, teacher, or Sunday school teacher, who by interpreting seems to be taking the Bible away from the common man or woman. And I know that I went over this, I spoke about this last um, Thursday, but I'm recapping this chapter because again, I'm learning to use Facebook, but the audience, I didn't get the audience that, that I needed to get to, to capture the meaning of what I was saying. So this is why I may be um, reiterating or rereading the chapter again. So let me continue. Our Sunday school teachers who, may, who by interpreting seems to be taking the Bible away from the common man or woman. It is their way of saying that the Bible is not an obscured book. After all, it is argued any person with half a brain can read it and understand it. The problem with too many preachers and teachers is that they dig around so much they tend to muddy the waters. What was clear to us when we read it it's not so clear anymore and again interpreting the Bible they brought a 
key illustration as to how I felt when I read the Word of God and again the enlightenment that the Holy Spirit brought and I've heard ministers who I believe in their own era or their own belief took and interpret that in a whole different way let's move on reading again straight from the author's book there is a lot of truth in this protest we agree that Christians should learn to read believe and obey in the Bible and this is our duty we are to read we are to believe and we are to obey the words of God as a Christian as a Christian that is our duty as a Christian and we especially agree that the Bible needs not to be an obscured book if studied and read properly keyword study and read properly and how many times people have read the Word of God ministers who are trained and those who are trained especially those who are trained and know what the scriptures mean no because they were taught this in school I was taught how to read the Word of God and when I see other ministers in the body of Christ misinterpreting the scriptures not because they don't know it's because they do know but they're interpreting things for their own gain and I have seen that and um, I usually pray and say oh Lord you know have mercy on them because they know what that scripture is saying but they're taking it and they're twisting it then you have the unlearned and the unlearned are those that read the Bible and interpret it the way that they won't want to but I can remember in the Bible I'm kind of not I'm kind of innocence going off but I'm not but if you remember all the the scholars all the learned people in the Bible Elijah he had a prophecy school Daniel went to school to learn what the um, what the what the Westerns or the Middle East people were learning and he also was reading the Word of God and that's how we all should be we as Christians again I will say the word we don't need to be lazy and we don't need to rely on other people other people to interpret things for us and I will move on by saying in fact we are conce we are convinced that that the single most serious problem people have with the Bible is not with a lack of understanding but with the fact that they understand most things too well for example with such a tech at text as so a text as do everything without grumbling are arguing that comes from from Philippians 2:14. Now the authors are actually given an example of what what they're what they're saying about interpreting. Um, the problem is not understanding it, but obeying it, putting it into practice. So what they're saying is, this is not anything hard to interpret, but the problem is us understanding what it means and for us as Christians to obey it we are also we also we are also agree that the p preacher or teacher is all too often prone to dig first and look later and thereby to cover up the plain meaning of the text which often lies on the surface let it be said at the outset and repeat repeat it throughout that the aim of good interpretation is not uniqueness one is not trying to discover what no one else has ever seen before I go on to read it says interpretation that aims at or thrives on uniqueness can usually be attributed to pride an attempt to out clever the rest of the world a false understanding of spirituality wherein the Bible is full of deeply burdened truths 
are waiting to be minded by the spiritual sensitive person with special insight. Our vast interest, the need to support a theo I'm sorry, theological bias, especially in dealing with the text that seem to go against that bias. Unique interpretations are usually wrong. This is not to say that the correct understanding of a text may not often seem unique to someone who hears it for the first time, but it is to say that the uniqueness is not the aim of our task. So what they're saying in this Bible, we're gonna get deeper, is not to say, they say it is not about the uniqueness um that's not that's not their goal in this book the aim is to um how do they say it's often seen unique to someone who hears it for the first time so they're saying yes it's very unique to someone who hears the word for the first time and it's it's unique to me and i'm sure sure some of you who have heard the word of god many times who have read the bible i've read the bible in and out and I was listening one day to, um, I have a Bible app on my phone that my son downloaded um, many years ago. And one day I was just sitting and I was just listening to the word. And I clearly heard the scripture where Jesus said, for us, we are to fear the, to fear the devil. So be careful, we are to fear him. But what he meant by that, you know, what we say, because if you go back, when... Michael the Archangel dealt with Satan. And this is key. He didn't say, I rebuke you, Satan. I put you under my feet, Satan. He says, the Lord rebukes you. And any of you who want to study the word of God, go and research what I said. Jesus said that we are to be afraid of him, meaning... He's not more powerful than Jesus Christ, meaning that he's clever and we need to watch ourselves in the things that we do and we say. Moving on. Hold on one second. My music stopped. Okay, let's continue. We're family here. Nothing's perfect, right? Okay, but moving on. But if the plain meaning is what interpretation is all about, then why interpret? Why not just read? Does not the plain meaning come simply from reading? Ah, key word, reading, people. We as Christians need to read for ourselves and not just go to church on Sunday and dust off the dust um on sunday morning and bring it to the the fellowship and let a minister read it we don't know where that minister may be because many times i have sat in church and i have heard ministers say things that was not at all what the true message of god was saying they were going through something in their own life and they took that scripture or those scriptures to um to appease it and fit to work in their own lives so let's continue does not the plain meaning come simply from reading in a sense yes but in a truer sense such as argument in both naive and unrealistic oh hold on but in but in a truer sense such an argument in both naive and un unrealistic because of two factors the nature of the reader and the nature of scripture see how this book is breaking everything down it is getting us to a point to truly understand how to read the precious word of god moving on the reader as an interpreter the first reason the first reason one needs to learn how to interpret is that whether one likes it or not every reader is at the same time time an interpreter that is most of us assume as we read that we also understand what we read we also tend to think that our understanding is the same thing as the holy spirit wow 
our human author's intent. And this is all involved in interpreting the, interpreting the scriptures of God. And it was a key thing, like I said, what we interpret is the same thing as the Holy Spirit interprets. And we've seen that. We've seen that in our own lives and era. We've seen that with teachers who are supposed to be teaching us correctly. Again, I will say this phrase, and I'll probably keep saying it throughout um, the teaching of instructions on how to read the Bible. The Lord said a time will come when man will not teach you, but my spirit will teach you. The first reason, I'm going to read it again. The first reason one needs to learn how to interpret is that whether one likes it or not, every reader is at the same time an interpreter. That is, most of us assume as we read that we also understand what we read. We also tend to think that our understanding is the same thing as the Holy Spirit, our human author's intent. And guys, unfortunately, y'all may hear me repeat certain paragraphs or certain lines because that's what I do in my own um, reading time. It's how I'm processing things and to get an understanding. And we have to get an understanding when we read something. However... It's not just to have knowledge, but it, ha it has all to do with understanding. And because we are in the end times, we have to have that understanding. Well, let me move on because it's um, already 16 minutes and counting down. However, we in um, invariably bring to the, net to the text all that we are with all of our experiences, culture, and prior experience of words and ideas. Sometimes what we bring to the text unintentionally to be sure leads us astray or else causes us to read all kind of foreign ideas into that text, into the text. Thus, when a person in our cult culture hears the word cross, centuries of Christian art and symbols cause most people automatically to think of the Roman cross, although there is like little likelihood that that was the shape of Jesus' cross, which was probably shaped like a T. Most Protestants and Catholics as well, when they read the text about the church at worship, automatically visions envisions people sitting in a building with pews, putting like put, um, much like their own. When Paul says, make no provision for the flesh to fulfill it lust, its lust. This comes from Romans 13, 14, NKJ, the New King James Version. People in most English-speaking cultures are apt to think that flesh means the body, and therefore that Paul is speaking of bodily appetites. But the word flesh, as Paul uses, it seldom refers to the body and in this text it almost certainly did not but to a spiritual metal medley sometimes called the sinful nature denoting totally self-centered existence therefore without intending to do so the reader is interpreting as he or she reads and unfortunately all too often interprets it incorrectly so he gave us the authors gave us an example of how we can misinterpret that particular scripture moving on this leads us to note further that in any case the reader of an English Bible is already involved in interpretation from for translations in itself a necessary form of interpretation your Bible your Bible what whatever translation you use which is your beginning point is in fact the end result of much scholar scholarly work translators are regularly called upon to make choices regarding meaning and their choices are going on affect how you understand it and that is so true Sorry guys, I'm getting a call while I got my music playing. 
moving forward nothing's going to stop us this leads us to note further that in any case the reader of an english bible sorry guys got distracted moving on good translators therefore take the problem of our language differences into consideration that is such a key point guys in this teaching about interpreting the bible and this is seen so much in the body of christ with the translations and not truly understanding they have some ministers i've heard tell some people that oh the king james is the only the only bible the only way and um and that's not so and then you have some people who are not understanding the bible because they're reading the king james version they're going to explain this further along in the i'm going to explain this further along in the teaching in the word but let's move on the need to interpret i'm sorry good translators therefore take the problem of our language differences into consideration but it is not an easy task Sorry guys, it is not an easy task. In Romans 13, 14, for example, shall we translate flesh as in King James, in the King James Version, or the NRS, or the NASU, or the ESU, etc. Because this is the word Paul used, and then leave it to an, interpre an interpreter to tell us that flesh here does not mean body or shall we help the reader and translate sinful nature as in the NIV TNIV GNB NLT etc or just ordered natural inclinations NJB because these more closely appropriate uh, approximate what Paul word really means we will take up this matter in greater details in the next chapter for now, it is sufficient to point out how the fact of translation um, in itself has already involved one in the task of interpretation. Moving forward, they're giving great examples. They're breaking it down on the books that we read and how it's broken down. The need to interpret is also to be found by noting what, go what goes on around us all the time. A simple look at the contemporary church, for example makes it abundantly clear that not all plain meanings are equally plain to all. It is of, of more than passing interpretist, interpretist. I'm sorry. It is more than passing interest that most of those in today's church who argue that women, oh, that's, one, that's another key illustration, women should keep silent in the church on the basis of first corinthians 14 through um, chapter 14 verses 34 and 35 at the same time deny the the validity of speaking in tongues and prophecy the very content context in which the silence passing occurs wow and those who affirm on the basis of first corinthians at chapter 11 uh, verses 2 to 16 these are good you guys can go back and look at these chapters for yourself but I feel like the authors in this particular what they did is the authors pointed out some key illustrations that have been arguments for years in the church moving on women as well as men should pray and prophesy usually deny that women must must do so with their heads covered for some the bible plainly plainly teaches believers believers baptism baptism by immersion others believe they can make a biblical case for infant baptism both eternal security and the possibility of losing one's salvation are preached in the church but ne but never by the same person yet both are affirmed as the plain meaning of biblical texts what are they showing us here the differences of how people interpret the Word of God not not through the Holy Spirit but how they're interpreting or your interpretation even the two authors of this book have some disagreements Wow they're being honest and transparent in this book as to what 
certain texts plainly mean. Yet all of us are reading the same Bible. And we are all trying to be obedient to what the text plainly means. And this is human error. Human assumptions. Be, let's Moving on. Besides these recognizable differences among Bible believing Christians, there are also all kinds of strange things afloat. One can usually recognize cults. For example, because they have an authority in addition to the Bible. Wow. But not all of them do. And in every case, they bend the truth by the way they select texts from the Bible itself. And they're getting ready to give you some examples. Every imaginable her heresy are practiced from the Aramism. Aramism, I'm probably saying it wrong. But Aramism is not what it is, but I hope you get it. It's A R I A N I S M. Aramams, Aramams, never mind, leave it alone. It's spelled A R I A N I S M. Denying Christ's de um, de deity of the Jehovah Witness to baptizing from the dead among Mormons to snakes, handling among Ap uh, Appalachi. Sikhs, Appalachians, sex claims to be supported by a text. So once again, this study is bringing forth examples of what some of us have heard and making, giving clarity to, for, for some of those who didn't understand. Moving on. I may go a little over because I'm trying to do like within 30 minutes, but it may go a little over because I want to finish this section. But moving on. Even more. Even among more theological orthodox people. These are orthodox. Are, if some of you don't know. These are Jews who don't believe yet that the Messiah has come. However many strange ideas manage to gain acceptance in various quarters. For example. One of the current rages among American Protestants. Especially charismatic. Is the so called wealth and health gospel. The good news is that God will for you and is financially and a material prosperity yes we've heard that and we are still hearing that one of the advocates of this gospel begins his book by arguing for for the plain sense of scripture and claiming that he puts the word of god first and foremost foremost throughout his study he says that it is not what you we think it says but what it actually says that counts Man, have we heard this from, from, from ministers. The plain meaning is what he is after. But one begins to wonder what the plain meaning is. Really, is when financial prosperity is argued as the will of God from such a text as John, I'm sorry, um, Third John 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that that thou mayest prosper and be in, in health, even as thy soul prosper. They took this from the King James Version. A text that is in fact has nothing to do with financial prosperity. Wow. Another example takes the plain meaning of the story of the rich young man. Mark 10, 17-22. Really listen to this, guys. Really listen to this. It says. Sorry, lost my place. Here we go. As precisely the opposite of what is actually what it actually says. And attributes the interpretation to the Holy Spirit. Who is the interpreter? One may rightly question whether the plain meaning is being sought at all. Perhaps the plain meaning is simply what such a writer wants the text to mean in order to support some pet 